A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. We're recording this on May 26, 2021. And today we are joined by a great friend of the show, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist and author, Dr. Judy Ho. Hi, Judy. Hi, Anna. So nice to see you. Oh, so nice to see you, Judy. We are going to need a therapy session after this episode because of the cases we have. Honestly, sure. we are. For sure. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a very deep breath. They both involve children. They both involve abductions. And one has a happy ending and the other one does not. And what I think our takeaway is going to be from this is that sense of fighting, learning, always being aware. And of course, there's also an age difference here, because I think, honestly, when you're only four years old, you have a lot of limited abilities just because you are so young, Mm -hmm. so young. Right. So we're going to need your insight. And yes, a little therapy at the end, maybe some wave music. I mean, because this one is tough. Okay, our cases this week. There's the horrifying case of four-year-old Cash Gurnan whose body was found left for dead in the street like a piece of trash. He had been abducted from his bed while this little boy was sleeping. But first, we have the case of an 11-year-old girl who narrowly escapes being kidnapped, and it was all caught on camera. This case is terrifying, but it is inspirational. Okay, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard about it because it made not only national, but international headlines because of this brazen attempt to steal this child in broad daylight mm. outside. I mean, it's honestly, if you had recounted what happened without the video, it would never be as jarring than when you match the two together. And we're going to show you those videos. Oh, Judy. Wow. All right. So the the little girl was sitting outside on a patch of grass and she is waiting for the school bus on a Tuesday morning. And she's sitting there on the grass. She's playing with some blue slime, some homemade blue slime, and she's waiting for the bus to come and pick her up. And what you're about to see is this white car, kind of like an SUV that pulls up, stops, man runs across the grass, grabs the girl. She's fighting like crazy. She says that he had a knife and she managed to kick him and trip him. And then because it was taking so long to get her, right, because, you know, you know that there's a limited amount of time because you've been fighting with this child. You're trying to grab the child. And at some point, someone's going to drive by. So you got to make that calculation in your brain do do I give up now and say, I'm out of here for my own safety? So he drops the child, gets back in the car, takes off, and that's where the case begins. It's it's overwhelming, Judy, this video. It's oh. overwhelming. How could every parent in America not be scared to death about having their child standing outside? Exactly. Especially because this was in broad daylight, as you mentioned. And this man was brazen enough to say, I'm not even going to try to hide what I'm doing. I'm literally just going to make a grab and a run for it. And it's amazing that Alyssa, I mean, she's 11 too. And I know parents, very good parents who have children younger than that and think, well, that's fine for my kids to play in the yard. It's okay. It's in the middle of the day. There's neighbors around. It's probably fine. Right. I mean, so I can tell that this is going to be a very, very scary story for a lot of good parents out there, but it is rare. These things are rare. I mean, we should be careful, but you shouldn't box your kids either, right? So it's something about educating your children about what to do when something like this happens and having that level of education in an age-appropriate way, no matter how old your child is. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about these two cases is they appear to be stranger abductions. The first one, for sure. The second one, there's some question about it, and we'll talk about it when we get to that. Here are the facts of the case. 11-year-old Alyssa Banal of Pensacola, Florida, 
acted very quickly and responded quickly because, she said, she and her mom loved to watch the TV show Law and Order SVU. And she learned on that television show that it's important to fight back, but it's also important to leave evidence. Evidence is crucial to figuring out what happened and who did it. So, okay, she's 11 years old, so she's smart enough to think that way. It was Tuesday morning, May 18th. Like I said, Alyssa's sitting there in that little patch of grass looking like every child in the world just waiting innocently for that school bus when that man runs out. Now, we've already, you know, taken a look at the video and we've seen how he ran and he grabbed her. That security camera, and there were a few in the neighborhood, were crucial to helping to to not only do the timestamp, description of the vehicle, license plate, but it didn't end there because they were also able to look at all of the security cameras in the area. And, and all of that helps capture the alleged assailant literally within hours of Alyssa's almost abduction. So let's listen to the little girl herself. She did an interview with TV station WKRG. And here's how she's explaining what's going on in the middle of that fight that we're watching. A man came out of the car and he had a knife in his hand. I tried running golf, but then he got me. He took me with his arm and I was able to get him down to the ground and I was able to get away. So she fought so hard that he gave up and ran away. My question for you, Judy, is what was the compulsion what is going on in the brain of someone like that who literally pulls over, sees the kid, and makes a run for it? Well, he's clearly banking on the fact that she was going to be an easy abduction. He has expected her maybe not to fight very hard or, you know, to be essentially kind of a passive child. And he got the wrong child, obviously. And I think he panicked. You know, it's you hear these stories even with adult abductions, children abductions, all kinds of things, robberies, where something doesn't go according to the plan of the criminal. And then they they flip out. They don't know what to do. And then they 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 run away because they realize, OK, this is not going the way that I had planned. So I really think that this man was this brazen because he was kind of expecting this to be an easy abduction. I mean, think about him being so crazy to think that this would be something to do in the daytime, that he would get away with it. So clearly he was a little narcissistic, maybe even in his whole concoction of this crime. But she was so amazing that she said, nope, I'm not going to go without a fight. And I think he got surprised and honestly a little scared. And the other thing is, you know, as he as he pulls over, it's not like he pulled up right next to her. He's actually, you know, on the other side of the road. He has to run across the patch to get to her. So and again, maybe in his world, that could have been an easy abduction. And you know what? If she hadn't fought, he could have scooped her up, put her in the car, and it would have taken only a few seconds. So that is true. But but I, I just... You know, I, I can't get into the mind of someone like this. So the minute this happens, she manages to, he, he runs and she runs in the opposite direction. She's screaming. She recognizes one of the neighbors, tells her what has just, tells the neighbor, is a gentleman, tells him exactly what's just happened. And, and so, you know, the police are called and the Escambia County Sheriff's Department comes out in full force. And here's what's very interesting about the way the Sheriff's Department deploys everyone. And I'm just a little bit familiar with this area because I used to live in Pensacola and be a reporter there and worked at, you know, with the sheriffs all the time. So I'm just a little familiar with the area and this department. So as they're deploying everyone, one of the things they want to also see are our gas station um, video cameras because they want to match, they want to continue to match the car and see if they can figure out which way the car went. Here's something that to me is the most fascinating thing about what the alleged suspect did, okay? Apparently, he stopped at a convenience store. This is the assailant, right? The alleged assailant stops at a convenience store where they can get a positive ID on him because while he's purchasing something, he's got to punch in his phone number in order to get his reward points. Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. 
I'm in the middle of an abduction, right? This is what's going on in my head, but I have to stop and make sure that I don't miss one of my points, you know, for my big gulp or my Slurpee, right? Right. Priorities. Uh, Priorities, Anna. (laughs) Okay. So that tells you where his brain is at. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're going to tell us where his brain is at. Who coordinates this? Like, how is all this going on in this man's head? I know. And I think that this really kind of actually does paint a good, consistent picture of this criminal that clearly he doesn't really know how to prioritize. And in his mind, it's like he's not even putting I mean, this is like completely putting the cart before the horse in so many ways. And then I think this is a person who thought through something, thought that it was going to go exactly as he was going to, you know, execute it. It didn't happen. And he's just kind of going about his day otherwise. And that doesn't make sense to me. But I think in his head, it made sense to him. And also he was scoping out this little girl a couple of weeks before he actually tried the abduction. So he's kind of been loitering around in this area, I think. And he probably noticed, okay, this girl's by herself. She's probably going to be by herself again some other afternoon. I'm just going to go take her, get a big gulp on the way, get my reward points. I mean, I do not know where somebody comes off thinking that that going to be just all in a day's work. But I think that that's really what he believed before he set out for that day. So in a way, he left those breadcrumbs for the authorities. You have the video from the attempted abduction. You have other security cameras. And then you have the convenience store video. So the sheriff's department has the description of the car, has the license plate. They have a, a pretty good idea who the guy is because of his phone number. And they zero in on the house to make this arrest. And to me, this is, these are the two incredible things. According to the sheriff's department, and we're going to take some clips from the news conference, that the person who they suspect of doing all of this not only attempted to disguise the car by starting to paint it so authorities wouldn't find it. I mean, we're talking about the same day here. We're not talking about weeks to conceal something. But there was something very telling on the alleged attacker. His arms, according to the sheriff, were covered in the blue slime that the (laughs) little girl was playing with and had all over herself and managed to get it all over him. So, wow. Here is more from Sheriff Chip Simons. We are here to announce that we have caught the animal that tried to kidnap an 11 year old girl this morning. The victim at the time of the attempted abduction was playing with blue slime as a, as a, as a toy. She had blue slime and it was all in her hands. The suspect, when we caught him, had blue slime all over his own arms. I think that blue slime, Judy, is the most telling of everything. I know it's not the strongest, but to me, that the car, the license plate, all put together. Wow. Right. It's amazing. I mean, again, usually cases don't have this many breadcrumbs this quickly. And thank goodness that we're able to get him located and because I don't, I can't even imagine. I mean, the person like this, you know, that was a failed abduction. You think somebody like that would stop? No, he'll plan the next abduction a couple of days later, because obviously this was in his grand master plan that he was going to do this at some point. So authorities have charged 30 year old Jared Stanga with attempted kidnapping, aggravated assault and battery. Now you mentioned how there's a belief that he the suspect here, Jared Stanga, may have been watching her or have tried something with Alyssa earlier. And this is very interesting. So the little girl says that a few weeks earlier on April 29th, that this guy or someone like him was watching her. She says that a man pulled up. She was again on her way to the bus stop, said that a man pulled up in a white car, tried to talk to her She got scared. She ran and made it to the bus, got to school, she says, told the teachers and the principal. Mm. And because of that incident, the mother, Alyssa's mother, had been walking her every morning over the last few weeks since that incident had happened in order to keep an eye on her. But on the morning that Alyssa was abducted, Um, She also has a younger daughter, another daughter, a toddler, 
needed an immediate diaper change. And you know, with a toddler, when there's an immediate diaper change necessary, it must be done. Okay. So this is what's going on in the household. Got to get one to the school bus. The other one's just, you know, had a stinky diaper. So she said to Alyssa, go on, go to the school bus. And then this happens. And the mother told um, several news organizations that she is absolutely filled with guilt over this, that it is her fault. Had she been there, this wouldn't have happened. And I, I just wanted to talk to you about how the two of them are going to process everything, because you have the mother who clearly is, is, is suffering terrible guilt about this. And then you have the little girl who has been traumatized. How, how do both of them process this and how do they process it together? I know it is so difficult, but I think that clearly any any mom, I think when they realize that their daughter escaped what could have been just something horrific that we can't even discuss. I mean, how bad it could have have been, you know, he, she may not even be alive, you know, um, that's so hard. It's hard for the mom to not have her thoughts go there. But I think that it's important to be honest about those feelings of guilt, but not to continue to bombard your child with them. Because then you put the onus on your child to have to make sure that you're okay. And to say, mommy, don't worry, everything turned out okay, I'm fine, right? And I know that that's not necessarily her intention, but people sometimes don't realize that some of their actions have these unintended consequences. So I think if if this is a trauma that the mom needs to process on her own, she should, maybe she should talk to a professional. But with her daughter, I think it's important just to say, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you that day, you know? but then kind of move on and say, what else can I do to help you to feel safe? What are the things that you need from me? And clearly we all understand this mom's predicament. I mean, moms of multiple children. I mean, there's just a lot to, to, to tend to. And sometimes one child's having this day, the next child needs this other thing. And she was just trying to manage everything at once. And I think that that is a big part of just, you know, asking her daughter, what can I do to help you to feel safe? And if she notices that Alyssa is having symptoms of post-traumatic stress, like nightmares and separation anxiety and starting to isolate, I think she does need to draw Alyssa out and ask her, do you need me to take you to a prof professional to talk about this? Maybe that's going to be helpful for you because something really did very scary happen to you. And even though you were very brave, it's still very scary. Uh, I'm curious as to how the child is going to process this because- Obviously, it's it's very frightening. It's it's frightening to watch. You can only imagine her terror as this was happening. Is it helping? You know, she the the young girl, the eleven year old Alyssa and her mom have done a lot of interviews, a lot of interviews, mm -hmm. which to many I think honestly is very helpful in some ways because they're making it very clear that that they had talked about safety. That even though the genesis of it may have come from a television show, a crime show, a drama, that there was that instilled thought process of fighting, mm -hmm. of fighting. And, you know, whether she even realized it consciously or subconsciously that she was covering him with slime. Do you know what I mean? So I, I'm wondering how all of this, is this talking publicly, is this helping or is it just making her relive it? You know, I really think it depends on the person. Everybody has a different relationship with how they process trauma and extreme stress. And sometimes talking about it on your own terms can be very helpful in processing it. But also there is a point of saturation where you're talking about it so much that you're revisiting that memory over and over again, and it doesn't allow you to move on. And I also think that even though, as you know, Anna, people have been very supportive of this family. They love this story. It's awesome. It's like, hey, you watched... Uh, um, law and order and you learn some things, you picked up some things about, like you said, you know, fighting for your life and just, you know, how to defend yourself. And that's really cool. But I also know that there's a minority of people who are critical of the mom or critical of the situation and or like they're glamorizing what's happening on TV. And, you know, there's always those naysayers. And I think that that's the scary thing when you take your story out publicly, because there's always somebody waiting just to pick you apart. And that's really hard for an 11 year old to deal with on top of the trauma and stress you already went through. There's another thing I want to talk about, and it's about the, the fighting back part, which I find really interesting. The sheriff said something that really, really just stuck with me. He talked about this um, concept of having a sixth 
sense. Now, he's a law and order guy, right? It's all about evidence. But I love that he went there. L- listen to what the sheriff said. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, a sixth sense, something that makes you feel um, like you're not safe. And, and we would encourage parents to have that discussion with their children. We would encourage teachers to have that discussion with your students, uh, principals to have that discussion with your teachers. And, and, and now is a great platform for me to say, to talk to them about their own safety. And again, talk to them. And I'd mentioned it earlier, if, if, if the number one headline isn't fight, 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 like your life depends on it, then uh, I don't know what else you should, you should put in there. So, Judy, I, I always talk about something I've learned later in life and I wish I had used in my younger, in my, that my younger self hadn't fought. And that's what I call your gut. Mm. You know, everyone says the term, follow your gut. And it wasn't until someone explained to me what my gut was that I intellectually understood it. It's like your sixth sense. And your gut is everything that you have experienced in your life, your brain is able to process all of this so much faster than you and give you a physical feeling that says, warning, danger, watch out. Okay, so you're getting this message. And and of course, Judy, I'm not the expert here, but this is how it's been explained to me. And this is why I now follow my gut so, so strongly, as opposed to fighting it. We always try to override the gut and say, Mm -hmm. this is an illogical feeling I'm having about this. I don't even know this person. Why am I having these feelings? And so you logically try to override this. I've stopped doing that. I listen to my gut. Even if I walk in some place and I get a feeling, I'm out of there. I'm like, you know what? My computer's pretty old, <laughs> but it's still processing. <laughs> right. I'm I'm going to listen to it. I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. I talk to people all the time about intuition and gut and what that is. People think, oh, it's just a feeling. And like you said, we, we do fight it. We're like, oh, no, like, let's just ignore that feeling. Like, you know, you kind of just have your logic override everything. And I think relying on your intuition generally has kind of like a bad connotation especially in Western parts of the world where analytical thinking is very much touted as like, this is what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be a logical person. But the crazy thing is that gut feelings actually comes from a part of your brain. It actually is part of your brain and part of your information processing. And it's actually part of the brain that isn't as akin to verbal expression. So we know the frontal lobe is in charge of executive functions and language, all of that stuff. But the lower parts of your brain, kind of the more primordial parts of your brain, if you will, are where the gut feelings are stored. It's a collection of your experiences that, and, you know, kind of what you've learned and absorbed from the world and the people around you. And it may not give you like a verbal signal, like don't do this in a very clear way with a logical explanation, but it still comes from a part of your brain that processes and analyzes all of your experiences. And that's why it is so important for us to follow our gut feeling. It's like that part of your brain doesn't use words to communicate what it knows. It uses feeling. It uses what we call intuition. And again, that whole gut feeling. That's why it is so important for us just to hone that intuition. And I think that now there are more people saying, you know what, we should pay more attention to this. There's science behind it. And sometimes even though you can't explain it, you just know what's right and what's wrong and what you're supposed to do in a situation. You should follow that instinct. Yeah. When it was finally explained to me in that logical way with some science behind it, I was able to comprehend it and I stopped fighting it. And mm-hmm. and I'm and I wish I had learned that as a younger person. So that's why I was really so taken when the sheriff talked about it, because it is something important. And, you know, in their field, of course, they have to be able to analyze and read a situation in seconds and make a decision. That's so right. I think this is uh, so I just love that he validated this concept of the sixth sense, your gut, your intuition and and children should also learn to start following those, even though their little computers are tiny and haven't processed a lot, they 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 do process information. Yes. So um, the other thing is, of course, SVU, the Law and Order show. This was a very big deal in this story, and the actress who's on that show, Mershka Hargitay, who plays Olivia Benson. Uh, managed to surprise Alyssa during an appearance on the Today Show, and she was very excited to meet her idol. It was like you could see Alyssa's like, I never thought I'd ever meet you. It's such a big deal for her. And what I liked about what um, Mariska did both on the show but also on her Instagram account was to go 
on and on about how the most important thing is you are okay. I am so happy that you are safe. It is the most important thing. You know, acknowledging how honored she is to be a part of Alyssa's good conclusion to a bad situation and just, you know, affirming for her that she's brave and strong and smart. And she's and she finished her um, Instagram post saying, with all my love, your number one fan, Marishka. So, you know, and their show is ripped from the headlines. So I have a feeling Blue Slime or something like it is going to make its way into a show one of these seasons. So one amazing. Seasons. Just the fact mm-hmm. that this 11 year old thought, you know, I need to leave some evidence behind for the police to find. That's an amazing thought for an 11 year old to have, because that's what she said in her interviews. Like, this is purposeful. It wasn't just I was having fun with my slime. So it just accidentally happened. This was intentional. I think that that's remarkable, Anna. Oh, it is. She's got to start her whole crime podcast. She's going to be a crime correspondent. I'm going to, you know, totally. Alyssa's really on to it. The most important thing, as everyone has said, is that she is safe. Mm -hmm. And as for the suspect who is charged in this case, Jared Stanga, he's being held on $1.5 million bond. His attorney claims that it wasn't him. And he's already starting um, the defense by saying that when Alyssa originally told the police in her description of the man that she thought the attacker was a Hispanic man and Stanga is white. So the attorney saying, you know, already you have the wrong person. I'm going to argue this is not a white or brown issue. This is going to be a blue slime issue at the end of the day. Right. And the car, the paint, the phone number at the gas station, I mean... Hey, you know what? Everybody's allowed to mount their own defense, okay? But his defense is looking pretty weak right now, given the fact that Alyssa had the foresight to essentially paint him with blue slime before he got away. Absolutely. What an incredible story. Really inspiring. Yes. Before we move on to our next case, here's a word from our sponsor. Getting a mortgage is a necessary part of the home buying process for many, but it doesn't have to be a hassle. Rocket Mortgage gives you the tools you need to understand all your options and buy a home with certainty. Not sure if you're ready to buy yet? Check out their online learning center for tips on where to start. When you are ready and need a lender who will help you understand all your mortgage options, Rocket can. Get started online at rocketmortgage.com slash true crime daily. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Well, this next child abduction case ends as tragically as it possibly can, with a four year old boy left dead in the street, discarded like a piece of trash. Saturday, May 15th at 6.50 a.m., Dallas police officers respond to a 911 call that a jogger has found a dead child in the street in a pool of blood. It was four-year-old Cash Gurnan. Cash had been sleeping in a toddler bed with his twin brother, Carter, when someone crept in while he was sleeping, picked him up out of his bed, and took off with him. It's like a horror film. You know, these cases don't happen a lot where someone breaks into a house and takes a child, but they have happened. They have, and they do. And to me, it is the most frightening of situations because when a baby is sleeping in a home, that should be their safest place. Mm -hmm. Oh, Judy, this one just really, really upsets me. I know it upsets everyone. Now, what's crucial here, like in the first case, is that there's a baby monitor in the room which captures this whole thing and shows the abduction and the assailant. And apparently, the assailant was also captured on security cameras around the home and in the neighborhood. So police say that this, again, happened at about 5 a.m., This is when Cash was lifted out of his bed. And now, according to the Daily Mail, two hours after the intruder takes Cash, two hours later, comes back for Carter. So that means for two hours, no one knows that Cash is gone. Mm -hmm. Carter, still sleeping, 
innocently dreaming in his little world. And the intruder comes back, but something happens. They don't know what, but it, it either startled the intruder or it made him change his mind because he left without taking the other twin. And then it's about this time that everything is, you know, starting to unravel about the timing of everything, uh, what's going on. The child is found in the street. So that is incredible to me. The, the level, I mean, that to, to take, go, take a child and then come back for the other one. Mm -hmm. And presumably by the time you come back for the second child, the first one presumably is dead. Right. I, I, I can't believe, like, what the heck's going on with something like this? I, I mean, I, I realize it's so depraved. No one can probably explain this for us. Mm. The following day, 18-year-old Darren Brown is arrested and charged with the abduction and theft, but not with murder because prosecutors are waiting for forensic evidence before any further charges. Police say that uh, neighborhood ring cameras captured Darren Brown casing the home some two months before the abduction. Brown lives with his parents about half a mile away, and he is being held on $1.5 million as well. His mother claims he didn't do it and is being framed. Now, the neighbors are upset because they say they claim that on their surveillance cameras, they saw him or a man who looked like him, not just casing the joint, but walking around and lifting um, door car, uh, door handles on cars to see if they were open in an attempt, you know, I guess, you know, to rummage through. And that they called the police and the police didn't do anything, meaning they didn't add any extra patrols or respond in a way which some neighbors feel like, look, we warned you something was going on and you didn't respond and therefore, some of this is on you. I, I can understand the frustration of neighbors yep. when, when they're alerting police to a situation. I absolutely understand that. But the circumstances of this one are so complex because of all of the people involved that one has to wonder that uh, I'm not sure extra patrols might have stopped something like this. Because it's, you're always looking for that, that one little opportunity, right? Right. So while all of this is going on about whether the house was under surveillance, whether this was premeditated, while all those discussions are going on, here's what's going on in the child's immediate life, which to me is the most troubling. So the, the twins were staying at the home of the father's ex Girlfriend, mm. ex-girlfriend. No one has even seen the father in public since this happened. Since Cash was murdered, we have not seen him. The father, Trevor Gurnan, appears to be in hiding because there is a bench warrant for his arrest for failing to appear in court on an unrelated matter earlier. So I think that's part of what's going on here, Judy. Mm -hmm. um, and he also has a criminal history, which we will get into in a second. Now let's get to the, the twins' biological mother before we even get to the house where the kids were staying. The biological mother, Melinda Seagroves, she says that the father took off with the babies earlier in the year, and she's been searching for them, and she had no idea where they were or that they were staying at the ex-girlfriend's house. So the remaining twin who has survived, Carter, Carter has been reunited with his biological mother. Okay. Now let's get to what's going on here with the ex-girlfriend where the twins are staying. Judy, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't even know where to go with this. There's so much in, in this case. All right. So Cash's father has just released a statement. Okay, this is the father that we haven't seen. He, he releases a statement saying that he's taking full responsibility for putting, you know, the care of his children in someone else's hands 
that made them vulnerable and that he's apologizing to the mother for failing to keep them out of danger. And he did this. He made this apology on his sister's YouTube channel. So here is a clip of what the father has to say about all of this. This choice I made with best of intentions has resulted in the most horrific outcome. I have paid the most ultimate and painful of price for my poor judgment. And I have to live with this devastation every single day. I will never forgive myself. If I could, I'd go back and do everything different. This is a nightmare that doesn't go away. Judy, I'm going to argue here that no, he's not paying the ultimate price. It is four-year-old Cash who has paid the ultimate price here. Not him. It's not about dad. It is about this child. What do you make of this? You know, I think that Clearly, at least he recognizes maybe he wasn't in his best mind, but the fact that he cut off complete contact with the biological mother and didn't even let them know where the children were, that is poor judgment. That's poor parenting. And I know that parents don't always get along, especially after a breakup, but for the sake of the children, co-parenting is so important. And technically, not informing your other parents, the biological parent um, of your children, that's that's something that I have seen people go to court over, have been prosecuted over. It's kidnapping in some cases. So it just looks like obviously the biological mother didn't decide to press charges. But essentially what she was saying is Trevor took the kids and I didn't even know where he was taking them. I had no say in terms of what would be safe for them. So no matter what Trevor says, oh, I, I thought that it was better for them. I thought that this was the best decision. I thought that my ex-girlfriend's house, there was a routine there. It doesn't matter. I mean, he really did essentially not perform the duties of a father. He just said, here you go, here, here are the kids, and left. So this is, I don't really care what he says on his apology. And like you said, he is not the person who paid the ultimate price. Cash paid the ultimate price. Carter is going to grow up with that and probably have guilt as well. How come I wasn't the one who was taken? And think about the poor biological mother. I mean, there's nothing you can do to take this back. There's no going back and there's no do-overs on this one. No. And he, um, the father says that the reason he left the twins in Dallas at his ex-girlfriend's house was because he didn't want to disrupt the boys' routine when he moved back to Houston. OK, that's ridiculous. So he was never going to see them again because he moved. I mean, I, I'm not really sure what his long term game plan was here. No, he's not thinking. Obviously, he's not no. thinking. A and no. also what he says there is contradicted in other statements. So his ex-girlfriend, Monica Sherwood, she originally told news agencies and the police that the reason the dad, the father, the biological father was not there was because he had to go to court ordered rehab. Now, remember, he's already got a warrant out for him for not showing up in court. So is that just a good excuse to tell the cops who are going to be looking for him? Plus, we also have a murder investigation and an abduction case here. I mean, oh. it, it's it, it it really is something I, I yeah. it's beyond disappointing. It is it is beyond disappointing. And yes, I do believe to some degree that this murder was preventable. I mean, when yeah. I, I do know that in, in this world that when someone is out to get you, it's sometimes, sadly, you know, they're always going to look for that opportunity. But I think there were a lot of red flags here and yes. there was a lot going on here. There was a lot going on. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the dad's criminal history. And also let's talk about the ex-girlfriend who literally was in charge here. Oh. And I don't believe legally... She was in charge to make these decisions. No. No. Absolutely not. And she had a concerning history herself. I mean, I know right. that Trevor is saying this is a person who I think is good for the boy's stability. I don't see how that could happen. I don't see how that could happen when she herself has multiple charges, extensive criminal history herself. And a little odd that it took, was it four hours or more before she discovered that one of the children were missing? So, I mean, how how much tabs are you keeping on these children if it took you four hours to discover that one of your children was gone? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. one is abducted. Yeah. The other one is still sleeping. Person comes back into the house a second time to That's try and insane. take the second child. Yet Ugh. you're still sleeping and you don't even realize that one is missing until the cops are like, there's a dead child in the street. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So I, yeah, it's great that there is a baby monitor in the room, but I'm sorry. Baby monitors do not replace human parenting. It just... Thank it's you. not a substitute. It is not a substitute. It and I'm not, not trying to rag on everybody here, but I'm but there is a four year old who is dead. Yeah. And he is the innocent victim here. So let's talk a little bit about the criminal history. So according to published reports, the father has a history of assault and drugs. Apparently in 2018, the father was arrested for assaulting his own father over a fight over a credit card bill. Trevor's most recent arrest problem, however, is for failing to appear in court this last March on a felony drug possession charge. So that could explain why one of the answers was, oh, he had to leave to go to drug rehab. Mm -hmm. Probably court ordered, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So there is still an arrest warrant for him. And... We have not seen him since the murder of his child, which I find very interesting because what's more important, dealing with the murder of your son or hiding your ass mm -hmm. so you don't get arrested on your on your bench warrant? Right. Where are your priorities? I think this just shows the lapse of judgment, the lack of responsibility, that this is a pattern for Trevor. This is not the first time where he's going through a tough time right now. You know, let's forgive him because this is he's under stress at this moment. No, this is a person, we're painting a picture of a person who has this pattern of neglect and lack of responsibility and not prioritizing and not thinking straight and quite honestly, seemingly being very selfish. You know, it doesn't really matter what kind of excuse he gave on his sister's YouTube channel. Um, I think all the parents in the world and people even who aren't parents and just are people who are good citizens are just enraged right now. Because as you mentioned, this is probably preventable. This was, mm -hmm. this is not, I mean, the person came back twice. Like, this is not just your run of the mill. You know, it, it could have happened to anybody. I don't think that that's true. Yeah. So the woman who was in charge of taking care of the twins, the ex, Monica Sherwood. She has several children of her own and some prior incidents for assault and drugs, according to Yahoo News. Her most recent arrest included charges of possession of methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. Now, here to me is a very interesting part of the narrative of this case. Apparently, at least one of her children is friends with the suspect who is charged with the abduction at this point, Darren Brown. He's the accused abductor. They went to high school together, and Darren Brown may have even visited the house up to two days before the abduction. Supposedly, she's told a few stories. She went to the supermarket, came back. He was in the house. Um, well, I guess he'd be in the house if he was friends with your other kids. But apparently, he was showing some favoritism, some favoritism towards cash. Mm. It's possible, right? All of that's possible. And the neighbors also say that Darren Brown, the man accused here, has been in that house and is no stranger to the family. So mm. they're verifying. Mm. It's like, no, no, he's been in and out of that house, which makes you wonder, did he actually break in? Right. Was the door open? Did he have a key? I have no idea. Oh my gosh. I've, oh. I, have, I have no idea. But what I am certain of is that a lot more could have been done to take care of these children. And this was not the way that Cash's life was supposed to end. Absolutely. And, you know, I wish we had more information at this point. Like, what was the motive for gruesomely murdering this little innocent baby? Police I have mean, not, not released that at all yet. We have no idea. It's crazy. It's like, what what was going on in Darren's mind? Like, I mean, it happened all so quickly that it didn't seem like he was abducting cash to claim him as his own or to try to even take care of him. It was like a very concerted, it feels like it was a very concerted abduction effort and killing because it happened so quickly. And I do want to remind everyone that he is not, that, that Darren Brown is not charged with killing cash. He is charged with the abduction 
Mm-hmm. And we want to also make clear that his mother says that he is innocent. Mm-hmm. And I do find this interesting. The fact that the autopsy is not back and the forensics are not back completely. Um, the fact that prosecutors are, are not charging with murder yet because they want to see the forensics. I'm just going to toss this out there as a possibility. It is possible. Let's just say, and again, innocent until, until proven guilty. If he did break into that house and he did steal that child, is it possible he could have stole that child for someone else? Mm-hmm. Just going to say, I'm not saying that that's true, but I think it's very interesting that the police have not charged him with murder. Right. So I, I really, as soon as we get those forensics in and we get more information, this is a case I really want to update because we for need sure. to figure out the rest of this story. Absolutely. There's so many missing pieces and just things that don't quite make sense. And all these complexities of the people who are involved and what was going on in Monica's mind and what is her relationship exactly with Darren and how close were they and how they had conversations about Cash and Carter. I mean, we don't have any of that information. No, and she hasn't been charged either. The woman who is um, taking care of the children, she's not been charged either. And I'm not suggesting that she will be. Just I do believe that a lot more is going to happen with this case once the forensic evidence comes in. Right. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime stories you all are talking about on our social media, on our website. And here's our very own Owen Michael. What's everyone talking about there, Owen? Hi, Anna. Hi, Dr. Judy. We do get our comments uh, across the board here on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the truecrimedaily.com website. This week, a lot of people are talking about uh, the Jared Stenga uh, abduction case, the blue slime abduction case you guys talked about at the top. Um, Mimi L. says, I just can't stop watching the video. Mighty glad she got away. That man needs to be put away. The next child might not be this fortunate. Alicia W. says, uh, teach your kids to fight back and scream. Most criminals don't expect that and freak out. That's uh, always good advice. Nicole R. says, as terrifying as this is to see, I am so glad this was caught on camera. People may hate being surveilled, but how can you argue when it helps in serving justice in this way? Uh, that's an interesting take, and uh, we'd love to hear your comments on that one as well. I agree with that. I really do. I think, you know, that video is so much more powerful than any possible description, and it scares the living daylights out of all of us as parents, absolutely. But I think it teaches the children, look, when mommy and daddy keep warning you, right, when your parents keep warning you to be careful, you know, whenever you're outside and be on guard, this is why. Right. There's a reason. And I agree. I mean, I think that there's that balance of freedom and privacy and then justice and teaching moments. And this is going to be a really good teaching moment for everyone. I think that, you know, we've all gone through those times, I think phases in our own lives where, you know, you just kind of almost feel like, oh, things are going to be fine. I can leave my front door open for a little bit while I put away the groceries. No big deal. Right. And then you eventually learn maybe that is not the safest thing to do. But I think that children need to be taught early that, you know, you just have to be prepared. And parents, I know that you don't want to talk about this, but it's important to educate your children early in an age appropriate way about stranger danger and what they should do if somebody tries to take them or touch them in an appropriate way. Like, get all of that out there early. Absolutely. It's never uh, right. Uh, that's good parenting. And uh, as far as the video surveillance, this is obviously uh, a thing, uh, a topic a lot of people are talking about as far as uh, everybody, a lot of people have ring cameras and various other surveillance video at businesses as well as residential places where people live. Um, this thing was caught on surveillance camera. So uh, we would be, there's a lot of information to, to glean here. So um, mm-hmm. stop in and weigh in on your thoughts on this one in particular. And a chunk of a Louisiana man's nose was reportedly bitten off by another bar patron. After a drink was spilled at about five in the morning in a Metairie bar in the New Orleans metro area last week, Aaron D says, number one rule of going out to the bar is nothing good happens after midnight. Ken J says, you can get drinks at 5 a.m. Apparently in uh, New Orleans area, you can. Uh, Esther C (laughs) says, uh, stay home, people, if you can't handle your drink. That (laughs) is the best advice I've read all day. It's interesting how all all the reactions are about what the bars open that late. Where is this right? It's, it, as opposed to what happened to the poor guy in his nose. 
I noticed, Owen, that you did not use my comment from Twitter, which I at the time thought was very clever, but I guess is not that clever. You know, I uh, I, I strive to get everything, Anna. Um, do you remember what it was? Because, you know, I, I, I read through yes, a Yes, because I wrote it down. Every day. Yes, because um, I'm share that annoying. The, please share with the group. Because <laughs> I am that annoying. Not at all. Yes. <laughs> I wrote this on Twitter and I said, open up bars again and it signals you can bite off a nose COVID free. Nature is healing, as they say. There you go. <laughs> I like your comment, normal. Anna. I Thank like you your comment. <laughs> yep. And you know what? New Orleans is a very interesting place. I mean, I remember when I went there for work and people were just, you know, you're, you're walking out of a bar and they just give you a plastic cup and you can pour the rest of your drink into the plastic cup and just walk down the street with it. I mean, you know, so... 5 a.m. 5 a.m. drinking in the streets. Uh, yeah, it's uh, that's a party town. Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, be careful out there. People watch your nose. Yeah, as I always say, no good could come of this. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. Good to see you. See you guys next week. Bye, Bye, Owen. Thank you. Wow, Judy, that is the end of this episode, and it was really, really heavy. I'm give us some healing thoughts to get us out of here. Well, as always, you did a great job covering these stories, Anna. And I think that even though one story was clearly more depressing than the other because we can never have Cash's life back, you still offered some really helpful nuggets and teaching moments for everybody listening. And I think that we talked about intuition, how important that is. I think that that should be the takeaway. I mean, in both of these cases, I think somebody's intuition was going off. And in one case, the person followed their intuition and they won. And in another case, maybe the parents of Cash and Carter should have had better intuition and maybe they should have followed their intuition, particularly Trevor. You know, it's not really the biological mother's fault. I mean, she really didn't know what was going on. But yeah. Trevor should have taken maybe a, a better look at his own decisions and thought about, you know, these are two little human lives, two human babies that they are helpless. They're not able to make these decisions for themselves. And, you know, when people become parents, your priorities should change. And it should all be about your children. So I do think that people probably took away some important lessons. And I look forward to hopefully hearing more updates about the story with Cash. And I hope that they find out more about what was going on and hopefully, you know, try to prevent these things from happening to our kids. Judy, if people want to know more about you or follow you on Instagram with all of those wonderful postings <laughs> of yours that helps us get through the day or just motivates us to especially dig out of a hole that we're often finding ourselves in. Where can people find you? Oh, thank you, Anna. Well, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Judy Ho. That's D-R-J-U-D-Y-H-O. Or you can check out what I'm up to at drjudyho.com. And you're still on a Netflix special, right? Yep, but still there. It's, you know, once you're on Netflix, I guess it kind of stays for a while. But, you know, it, it the shows get replaced by other shows that are more interesting and popular for the time. But I, I was really proud of the work that we did on um, Crime Scene. I thought that that was a, a good program. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Thank you. It's always a pleasure having you on. You can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Uh, you can find all our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Of course, you can watch us on YouTube and you can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter, which Owen Michael puts together for you at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.